Hello everyone and welcome back to this nanophotonics and plasmonics course. Today we're going to discuss uh, electrodynamics uh, which will be laying down the theoretical foundations for nanophotonics. So uh, optical radiations in nanophotonics is typically described as a wave, uh, using a wave picture as opposed to corpuscular nature of, of light and therefore it's going to require a classical field theory which is based on Maxwell's equations. So before uh, uh, we actually dive into uh, electrodynamics, I have also to mention that uh, in nano-optics, due to the small size of the, the, the systems we are interested in, such as molecules and quantum dots, the properties of these systems are uh, usually described using quantum mechanics. Uh, so it requires quantum mechanics to describe the properties of molecules and, and small uh, nanoparticles, such as quantum dots. So when you look at the light matter interaction, uh, that which is something that we're going to be looking into throughout the the rest of the of the of the courses, uh, we're going to use semi-classical theory, which combine a classical field theory uh, via Maxwell's equations and uh, quantum mechanics for those uh, small objects. So uh, let me just uh, show you again uh, the original Maxwell's equations that have been introduced by uh, Maxwell in, in his original paper in the 1860s. So if you recall what I mentioned during the first, uh, the first video on his, the, during the historical survey, the original Maxwell's equations are far from looking uh, like the four Maxwell's equations as we know today and that are taught in any electrodynamics course at the college level. However, if you reformulate those, those equations, into a more uh, modern vector form, as, as it's shown here on the right, uh, you can recognize some of these equations, like the total current density, uh, Gauss law for magnetism, Ampere-Maxwell law, uh, Faraday's law here, uh, the elect uh, electric elasticity equation or constitutive equation, Ohm's law, Gauss law, and the continuity equation. So now those equations, although they are not uh, the uh, any of the four uh, Maxwell's equations that uh, we know today, uh, they can be derived uh, fairly straightforwardly from the, the, the four Maxwell's equations that are taught in modern uh, electromagnetism or electrodynamics courses. Uh, so throughout this chapter, uh, we're gonna actually recover several of these, these equations and I'm gonna highlight them uh, with a little orange star every time we actually derive one of these equations from Maxwell's equations. So let's uh, start discussing those Maxwell's equations uh, as we know today. Uh, the modern equations, uh, once again, as reformatted by Oliver Heaviside. Uh, so these are the four equations, uh, vector form, uh, where you, uh, we have introduced uh, the four fundamental uh, electromagnetic uh, fields. So we have uh, the electric field, E. Uh, we have the electric displacement, D. The magnetic field, H. And the magnetic induction, B. Uh, on top of these uh, four electromagnetic fields, uh, we have uh, two additional physical quantities. We have rho, which describes the uh, charge density, uh, and J, that describes the, the current density. So let's discuss briefly what the physical meaning of those equations are. So the first one, uh, which is known as the Faraday's law, uh, really uh, describes the, the relationship uh, between electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, and that they're resulting from each other. So if you have a changing magnetic flux uh, in time, uh, then this induces an electric field. Uh, the second one, which is known as Ampere's law, states that basically a, mag a magnetic field uh, around an electric current is proportional to this uh, electric current, uh, which serves as, as its source. And uh, a, a change in time of the electric displacements is equivalent to this uh, to this current. The third one, which is Ga uh, Gauss law, uh, states that the total electric field or the total electric flux uh, out of a closed surface is equal actually to the charge enclosed inside the surface uh, divided by the, the permittivity. Uh, we see later that this ID is actually proportional to the electric field E uh, with uh, the permittivity included. Um, and of course, in absence of charge, uh, for instance, if you're in a vacuum, uh, then therefore uh, there's no electric displacement, there's no electric field. Uh, the last one, which is also Gauss law, but for magnetism, states that 
in a given volume the sum of the, the magnetic fields line going uh, in and going out uh, or, or equal. So this also states basically that the, the magnetic fields form closed loops and uh, this uh, has a certain consequence in uh, terms of uh, the non-existence of magnetic monopoles. So um, with that in mind, we can start uh, playing around uh, with these equations. We can actually uh, rederive, as I said, some of the equations that Maxwell introduced in his original paper. Uh, the first one is the conservation of charge. Uh, and this is already implicit into uh, Maxwell's equation. So if you take uh, the, the, the divergence uh, of, uh, of the Ampere's law, so you have, if you have the, the curve of the magnetic field, uh, which basically is going to be given by, the, by Ampere's law, the second equation I've shown just the slide before, you take the divergence of this, and what you obtain is the conservation of charge uh, which is uh, basically the, one of the, the equations that Maxwell introduced in his original paper in 1961. So the electromagnetic field uh, and the electromagnetic properties in general uh, of the medium are discussed in terms of uh, macroscopic quantities, uh, which are the polarization, so macroscopic polarization and the macroscopic magnetization. So those two quantities are uh, here to describe how uh, electromagnetic fields are actually uh, impacting matter. So uh, we have those two relations that describe the relationship between the electric fields, uh, electric displacement uh, with the polarization, as well as the magnetic field and magnetic induction uh, with the magnetization. So in this in this case, uh, epsilon node and mu node are the dielectric permittivity and magnetic permeability of vacuum. So moving forward, uh, we can actually derive directly from Maxwell's equations uh, and more specifically from the curve uh, equations, uh, which are given here on the, on, on the left-hand side, we can actually derive the wave equations. So if you, take, if you start from, uh, from the Maxwell's curl equations here and you introduce the concept of polarization and uh, magnetization that we've just discussed uh, the slide before, uh, you actually substitute uh, the electric uh, displacement d uh, using the first uh, the first equation here on the on the uh, on the on the right, and you substitute the the magnetic induction b uh, using the second equation on the right. You can actually derive very straightforwardly uh, the two wave equations for the electric field on the on the uh, on the on the on the top uh, the top part here and the magnetic field uh, at the, the, on the lower part here. So those two wave equations uh, describe uh, the propagation of those electromagnetic waves uh, generating by non-zero sources, uh, charges and currents. So uh, the actual derivation, the actual mathematical derivations or the steps for the derivation uh, to reach these wave equations would be uh, uploaded uh, online. So once you have those uh, wave equations, we can actually uh, look into that uh, a little bit further. Uh, and the first thing we notice is actually uh, looking at this, uh, this central term here, uh, where you have one over C squared that shows up, which is the speed of light. So this just simply tells you that uh, light, uh, or that, not, that matter, electric fields and magnetic fields are actually propagating at the same speed, which is the speed of light. So in this wave net with description of uh, of light, uh, you have both an electric field component here in red on this uh, schematic and uh, magnetic fields here in blue, and they propagate in space and time at a constant uh, velocity uh, c, uh, which is the same for for both components. Uh, what we can also discuss from this wave equation uh, is the term that we have here in in parentheses uh, in this bracket. Uh, which is the total current density. So this total current density contains three terms. We have a, a term J, which is the current density, uh, which can be broken down into two different contributions. Uh, JS, which is a source current density. Uh, JC, which is a, an induced convection current density. We're going to be discussing uh, later. And then we have the time variation of the polarization. And, uh, and this term here that in includes 
uh, influence the magnetization. So something which is uh, uh, important to notice is that this equation is also one of uh, original Max Max's equation. So this uh, this total current density uh, equation uh, is actually one of uh, Max's equations uh, from the original paper, and you see that it can be derived uh, or shown uh, shows up naturally from the wave equation of the electric field, uh, and which is directly derived from Max's equations. So um, something that we, we need to discuss uh, is actually uh, something of importance when you deal with light matter interaction. So Maxwell's equations define the fields, electric and magnetic fields, resulting from charges and, and currents. Uh, however, uh, they do not uh, describe how these charges and currents are actually being generated. Uh, and this is something which is very important when you deal with, with matter. So, uh, additional uh, material specific equations are required uh, to find self-consistent solutions uh, and those equations are known as constitutive relations. So they are described, uh, they describe how the medium behaves uh, under the influence of the fields, on both electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, so for instance, uh, when you have an external electric field uh, applied on certain medium a material that is described by certain dielectric permittivity, epsilon, then in turn this induces uh, certain electric displacements. Uh, a similar comment can be done with magnetic fields uh, on the medium which is described by a certain uh, magnetic permeability mu uh, and this induces a magnetic induction uh, field B. Uh, you can actually rewrite those equations uh, um, and basically rewriting uh, instead of using the dielectric permittivity and ma magnetic permeability, you can use the susceptibilities, magnetic and electric susceptibilities, and express uh, macroscopic polarization and uh, macroscopic uh, magnetization as a function of the electric and magnetic fields. So uh, something we, uh, we need to, to mention as well is that those equations are not necessarily derived from Maxwell's equations, they're complementary, they have been introduced uh, after uh, Maxwell's equations to complement the light matter interaction uh, and those equations actually introduced uh, in Maxwell's original paper. So with that in mind uh, I want to, uh, to wrap up this, this, first, this first short video uh, discussing those constitutive relations and more specifically how those relations are uh, changed and are adapted to describe different type of, of materials. So for instance, if you have nonlinear media, uh, so higher order terms can be added uh, to the right hand side of the equation. So for instance, the electric displacement here is proportional to the electric field. And if you have actually a nonlinear materials, you can actually uh, add an additional term, uh, which is gonna be proportional to uh, E squared. So the, the second, uh, second power of the electric field or the third power of the electric field. The same for the magnetic field. So this is going to be discussed extensively in chapter 16 uh, in the non-linear uh, non, uh, optics and plasmonics chapter. Uh, now, uh, if you have an anisotropic media, for instance, where uh, the properties uh, of the medium uh, changes uh, depending on the orientation of the electric field and magnetic field, uh, then instead of having a, a linear uh, a linear constant scalar value here for epsilon, then we have a tensor. So you can substitute this epsilon by a tensor uh, of values that are going to describe how the material will behave under the uh, under an excitation by electric field or magnetic field in different directions in space, with respect to the to the atomic lattice. Um, then we can also describe uh, dispersive media, and it's something which is going to be very important when we're going to be talking about plasmonics, because metals. Uh, such as uh, silver and gold or highly dispersive media, media uh, which means that basically the material we actually react and behave differently uh, under different uh, different frequencies of, of uh, optical excitation. So if we have a different electro electromagnetic field of different frequencies, uh, the, 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 the value of epsilon will actually change. So instead of having a constant value epsilon, then we're going to have a function of uh, an epsilon, which is going to be a function of, of the frequency of the electromagnetic field. Uh, the same for uh, magnetic properties, uh, but most of uh, the, the, uh, the discussion that we're going to be having in the next 
uh, in the next chapters, we not deal with any magnetic materials. So this is something which is very general, but in our case, we only gonna be dealing with uh, dispersive or non-dispersive dielectric uh, media. Uh, finally, uh, we can also discuss the special uh, dispersion, which is also known as non-locality. Uh, this is observed when uh, object, uh, si the object size is comparable uh, to the mean three path of the electrons uh, in, the, in that material, uh, or if it's at material interfaces. So uh, we will briefly discuss that uh, much later on in the video uh, on plasmonics, but uh, that's something that's going to be uh, generally uh, overlooked here. It's not, it's a bit out of the scope of this, of this course.